Cold within him froze his old features, nipped his pointed nose, shriveled his cheek, stiffened his gait, made his eyes red, his thin lips blue, and spoke out shrewdly in his grating voice. A frosty rime was on his head and on his eyebrows and his wiry chin. He carried his own low temperature always about him. He iced his office in the dog days and didn't thaw it one degree at Christmas. And this goes on for a couple of pages. So lots of adjectives, lots of subordinate clauses, a piling up of detail, very ornamented. Uh, or the moment when you realize that something you thought about your character isn't true. Something else, on the other hand, is true, and then you have to backtrack and, um, and, and work it through in a different way. There's, there's no shame in backtracking. There's no shame in revision. There's no shame in realizing that you, you got it wrong. Hey guys, today I want to talk to you about master classes, specifically Margaret Atwood's class. Um, guys, I cannot recommend these enough. I know I sound like an ad. I'm so sorry about that, but seriously, these classes have been awesome. Um, I, they've just made me think about writing like how I used to. There comes a point where you've written so many books and you've kind of been in that daily grind of the marketing and the the you know networking and all the other things that come along with being an author that you forget about the actual process of writing and why you got into it in the first place so i've been taking these master classes as part part of my project quarantine i have started learning a new language which is spanish and that is for my book um mexico calling I have also, and I may actually continue to learn it. I'm actually finding it really interesting. And I have also started these master classes. So far, I've completed two classes, which were Dan Brown, um, Margaret Atwood, and I'm halfway through Joyce Carol Oates. I don't know which one I like. I thought I liked Dan Brown's the most, and I think that's because he writes thrillers. So for me, because it's kind of closer to most of my work, I got a lot out of it, but Margaret, I keep going back to hers. There is such a warm, um, I don't know, just her touch, her voice, the way that she speaks about writing, her passion for writing comes through that, that class. And I absolutely love that. Now, the caveat here is that she is a feminist and does not do anything to hide that. I am also a feminist and you won't see me hiding it either. It's who I am. I grew up with all brothers. I have only sons. I love men, absolutely love men, but I am outnumbered. And I am very fortunate that the men in my life are very pro-women. And so there isn't a lot of scuffle there. However, I have always been a natural feminist. I think it was part of surviving a household with only brothers. And that has carried on into my adult life. Margaret shares that. And part of that is part of why I loved her class. So if you are not a feminist, you may not like that one as much. You may prefer dance. I don't know. But again, who cares? That's not even the point. I want to go over some of the key things I learned in her class for those who aren't taking it. I want to kind of just cliff note you on what, what she talks about. Um, originally, I said four stars out of five for this class. But as I'm taking the other classes, you know, it's sometimes like the first book you read, you're harder on. So now I'm probably going to go back and say, oh, no, that's five stars. That was my favorite class. But we'll see. Um, a couple of the key points that, that she made that I really, that resonated with me was that the wastebasket is your friend, that revisions are okay, that it is okay to say, you know what, this is not working. Scratch it and start over. And that's something I really struggle with because I hate to waste the words. I'm constantly struggling with time management because I just have so much on my plate. So to waste words feels yuck. 
but she's she's right. Sometimes it doesn't work and it's worth it to just say to the words, start over because you end up actually going faster when you're writing something that, that is working, that you love. Um, another thing she talked about that I liked is that you need to make your own rules. You're going to hear so many millions of writing rules, but there's no one way to write. You can't just, because it fits somebody, you know, it's like shoes. Everybody has a different shoe size. And while all the size nines in the world may love their comfy size nine shoes, somebody might say, well, that's too narrow. My foot's wide. Another person, well, I don't like the sole of that. You've got to find the fit that works for you. Yes, there are some very standard rules. You know, you need to write often, practice in order to get better. I mean, that's just common sense. But how you write in your process of writing can be different. And one of the things that she talks about is if it doesn't fit your process, toss it in that same wastebasket. And I love that because I am a rule breaker by nature. It's my spirit, my personality, call it what you will, but it is who I am. So it was nice to have permission, so to speak, from one of the best writers that I've ever read. So I thought that was really cool. Um, she talks a lot about, she reads from her books sometimes. I'm finding that they all do that. And, and that makes sense to me. They're using their own books as examples as they teach these, teach these classes. Um, and she talks a lot about dialogue. One thing that I noticed, and I hadn't, I didn't remember this. It's been a long time since I've read her. Um, but I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm ordering a bunch of her books off a of book outlet. It looks like she doesn't put quotations in dialogue, which to me is really weird. And while that may be her just breaking a rule, I don't like that. I want quotes in my, in my dialogue, but she does talk about dialogue and how it's important, especially with genres like historical fiction, with, that you make that dialogue match the time that you're writing in. And I think that the way that I struggle with that is that when I'm writing anything that's historical and I don't know how people spoke, I will overly research. And she talks about that too. I will get too into trying to make it like time, time period appropriate that the dialogue sounds like so contrived. It's like ridiculous. So that was a great reminder and a great help to me, that section. Um, I did star off a couple of things that, that really resonated. She does a lot of like talking about fairy tales that we sort of all know. Um, Little Red Riding Hood and, and in the trailer, you can see that trailer all over the place. She talks about, you know, you could tell the story one way, which is basically Little Red Riding Hood goes off to deliver stuff to grandma and yet grandma has been eaten by the wolf or start it from grandma's point of view. It was dark inside the wolf. And that's what gripped me and made me want to watch hers first was that trailer. And, and she does that throughout the whole class. It's super cool. She will talk about, well, what if you started it here? So she often talks about point of view. And instead of like with retails, especially when you do a retail, instead of telling it from the main character's point of view, what about being a different character and the perspective and the way that a book or story unfolds is so different when it's told from a different point of view. So I thought that that was super helpful. Um, you know, I've thought of that and I've actually done that, but the way that she explained it is like with an eloquence that I will never, ever have. So that was neat. Um, another particularly helpful section to me was using a, a senses, um, sensory details. I am really weak in this area and I know it. I'm terrible with description and I'm awful with remembering like, you know, touch, smell, all those things. And she compared it to film. She said, you know, writers have an advantage we are able to talk about smell. You can't show smell in a film. So we need to take that and grab it and be glad that's something our art affords us that, that filmmakers, for example, don't get. Um, and she gave some tips on that and I thought that that was really helpful. And a lot of it came down to the particular, she calls it. You know, you wanted the particular tree, the particular person, the particular object. So what she's saying is, it's one thing to talk about a row of trees. But when you get into describing the tree with the tire spring swing with the initial G etched into the into the wood behind the bark, which is a maple tree with four leaves because, you know, it's winter versus any old tree makes all the difference. So part of your process can be, yeah, write that first draft. But when you go back in and a tree is an essential part of the story, get into that nitty gritty of that tree. Does it hang right? Does it hang left? Does the, do the limbs stand up straight? Does it sort of shelter people? Is it metaphorical to the story? 
those kind of things. And I thought that was super helpful and something I will incorporate into my own work. Um, as far as Margaret herself, my observations of her is, wow. I mean, first of all, what a brilliant mind, but we knew that. She is just so well read. She made me want to kick my own ass for not remembering half the classics she talked about, for not reading half of the books she talked about. And so now in my quarantine, whatever this is, I'm adding some classics to my reading list. I'm going to skip past some of the stuff I haven't had on my TBR just because it was cool and the new thing. Forget it. I'm going back to the basics because some of the things she talked about really made me think about the technical, what I lack technically in my writing. Um, she writes a lot of speculative fiction and, and with that often comes science. Her knowledge of science and what she will do to get that knowledge is just commendable. She will call somebody at NASA and say, hey, how would this work? That's something I need to be doing more of. And I used to do, but I just haven't had the time. So I've stopped doing that. So one of my goals as I change my sort of writing path, and which I think I've been pretty transparent, that is something I'm working on doing right now, is that I think I'm going to slow down and put more time into that research again, because I do think it added to the quality of my writing. Um, I did a ton of research when it came to the Pretty Bones and Bone books, and it paid off. It really did. Plus, I learned about something that completely fascinated me, which was funeral homes and eventually changed my therapy specialty. So it all kind of worked in a circle. And Margaret talks about that. You know, if you're interested in it, research it, find it all out. Dan also talks about that. So I will do a review specific to him. I will do one in each masterclass I take. Um, and it's cool to see where their threads meet up. Mostly these classes are very different perspectives, which makes it great because it's not the same content. It's the content they want to talk about, which I absolutely love. Um, my favorite quote, forget the genre, tell me the story. Love it. I want to like tattoo that on my head. I say that all the time and people don't want to listen. Stop worrying about what the darn genre is. Let the publisher figure that out. That is their problem. Who cares if you're a horror author? Tell me the story. I don't want to hear I'm a romance author. Tell me the story. If that, ro that book turns out romance, great. If it doesn't, there's nothing wrong with that. It doesn't matter what shelf, and she says this directly, your book ends up on. It matters that your book ends up on the shelf. And that applies to indie as well, whether it goes on a shelf or not. What category you're in means nothing. What matters is that the quality of the story is there. And the genre, it'll work itself out. And that is why I will never go back to, I'm a horror author. I'm a romance author because I don't want to box myself in. I want to be able to write the story the way the story works for the story's sake of the story because I believe that is how you get a better story. But that's just a JMO. Is that how they say it? I don't know. Yeah. So genre doesn't define a book. All of that I just covered. Um, she talked about reviews and her quote with that was don't believe the billboards. Don't get tied up in reviews. And I've got, I, I don't know if I've posted them yet, but I will have videos on reviews. I don't even read my reviews. I've talked about it in a couple. I think the one I did on um, Author Central and how to list, uh, how to set up your author page on Amazon. I don't read reviews. It's just to me, if it's a really substantial review that I believe has a lot of feedback in it that I can use, yeah, I'll go for it. But a random troll one starring me, no, I'm not going to believe that hype because why? That's just going to give my inner critic doubt and it's just not, it's not productive. So my overall thoughts for Margaret Atwood's masterclass. I loved her details. I love the example she gave. Every single thing she talked about, she gave us a detail and an example. I loved her honesty. I found her to be very down to earth. I found her to be very real. Um, I mean, she literally said I'm at the end of my trajectory. Basically, I'm about to die. And that this was a gift she wanted to leave the world. Like, talk about, like, saying it like it is. That's pretty commendable for someone to say, um, how I don't know how old she is, but, you know, she's getting up there. And this is important to me because I want to leave other writers a gift. Because writing is important to me, and I want writing to continue past me. And I want to basically immortalize myself. I mean, I think we all, as authors... Want our, want our books to still be there somewhere. 
in the world when we're gone. It's part of our legacy, whether we can say that out loud or not. And I think that's what she was talking about in a roundabout way, but in a pretty direct way too. I loved that. Um, and I think what a gift to the world her work is now, will always be. I mean, she's one of the greatest. I am honored to have taken that class. I think it's fantastic she put it out there. I would love to do another one. I mean, I could listen to her for hours. I will definitely go back to that class. I've downloaded the workbook and I plan on doing every step of the way. I think she's someone with a lot to teach. Yeah, forget it. It's no more four stars, we're going five. Awesome, awesome class. I highly recommend it, guys. www.masterclass.com. I know I sound like a darn ad again. I can't help it. If I find something I believe in, I'm gonna tell you about it. Thanks for listening, guys. Happy reading, happy writing, happy learning, happy learning Spanish. I'll do a thing. I'll do a video in part Spanish. You guys won't believe it. I'm doing good. I will talk to you soon. If you like the video, there will be more. I will literally review every masterclass I take. And I'm me, so I'll probably even get into cooking. Who knows? Please hit thumbs up, like, subscribe to the channel, and I will talk to you again next time. Till next time, peace, love, books, and crazy.